I'm Mike Planner, I'm Associate Director for Historical Collections, and I want to welcome you to yet another in our Reynolds Historical Lecture Series. Melissa Morgan has her MBA from the University of South Alabama, but of importance to us today, she also has her MA in Art History from the University of Alabama, which I understand she's uh, pursued as part of a joint program with UAB. Currently, she is Assistant Director of the Center for Living Arts and Director of Space 31 at the at Cathedral Square in Mobile, Alabama. To capture the historic interplay of faith and medicine, Melissa suggested that I quote uh, this fourth century Bishop Basil, which we were talking before uh, this morning, and uh, somehow Bishop Basil came up. And um, so let me just quote to, to sort of frame the upcoming lecture. Bishop Basil from the fourth century says this, to place the hope of one's health in the hands of the doctor is an act of an irrational animal. <laughs> this, nevertheless, is what we observe in the case of certain unhappy persons who do not hesitate to call doctors their saviors. Yet, to reject entirely the benefits to be derived from this art is the sign of a pettish nature. We should neither repudiate this art altogether, nor does it behoove us to repose all our confidence in it. When reason allows, we call in the doctor, but we do not leave off hoping in God. Well, with that, those pearls of wisdom from Bishop Basil, uh, we'll keep that in mind. Uh, and uh, with that in mind, and that is the context for our upcoming lecture, just please join me in welcoming Melissa Morgan as she tells us about medical iconography of the early modern period, 1501 to 1750. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, well, it's interesting because when I got this phone call, uh, <laughs> I have, uh, when Stephanie called me, Stephanie Rufus, the curator here, called me, um, I thought it was very interesting because I had never heard of Exvotos. I've studied art history for quite a long time and had been in, in the museum field for quite a while. And, and I thought, well, goodness, what are they? And I was very interested into developing and, and understanding what they exactly were. I, coming from a, a Methodist background, was not uh, very familiar with all of them. So um, the devotional faith of the, of, the, of the saints is not something that, that we study. So um, I thought it was very interesting about this. Uh, I'm going to start basically kind of giving you an overview going into the going into the 1400s because a lot of things happened in the 1400s and leading into the 1500s, which actually is the reasoning behind a lot of these exposures. So what I also want to do, I'm a very informal speaker, and so if you have any questions or any any concerns, please raise your hands because I think this is a, a very learning uh, learning lecture, if you will. Okay. Basically, ex votos can be summarized in three elements. One is that they have to depict, de depict an event, either a sickness or a miracle of someone being healed or a prayer for them to be healed. Um, there's always a narrative. There generally is, there always is a saint or a deity. Very rarely do you see, uh, some I have seen in the 1600s where they completely left out the deities. Um, a lot of times you will have them floating, as you can see in the, the bottom left-hand corner. I think they gave me a person, but I don't know where that went. So, um, where is it there? Oh. And generally the deities are always floating. They're in the corners or the airs, and so you always have the the image of greatness because they are holier than thou. They're always generally, they're always around and they're always depicting an event or a narrative that goes on. I picked two here that um, kind of give you a completely different uh, century that can kind of give you an idea of how they can transition from century to century because they all are very, very different and they all are unique. Um, Ex-votos themselves 
were not particularly done by what what us in the field called a, a, a professional artist. They were done by an everyday artist, if you will. And so Everyday Miracles is a very apropos title for that. Um, one of the things that happened during the 1400s, of course, there was a, a we were in the Dark Ages, we were in the Middle Ages. A lot of Europe um, were being killed off by the Black Death or the Black Plague. The um, populations in the city-states were going down by 25% to 50%. In some of the uh, in some of the cities, so it was a very dark and very um, very tumultuous time at that point. Um, one of the things that came about during the 1400s was humanism and the Renaissance. Going into the end of the 1400s into the 1500s, a lot of certain things happened. Um, one of the main things is humanism. Um, a lot of events led up to this. Humanism is basically. The, the theories that, um, that the personal uh, beauty of the human body is, is profound. It is, it is the study of that, and that you have the um, ability to achieve great things, and that the individual has the power to make its own destiny, to, to live its own destiny. And that's one of the things that um, a lot of the artists try to represent during this time. And a lot of the ex votos kind of, um, as we'll see, kind of touch on that. One of the great humanists of this time was Leonardo da Vinci. And I bring up um, some of the, the big uh, artists of the time just because they were the ones that were studying the, the theories and, the, and the, the ideas of this time. They were the ones that were studying all the philosophers, all of the uh, Plato, the Aristotle, those guys who were coming up through this time, through the Renaissance. Um, Leonardo, which, um, which you may or may not know, studied autopsies. He went into the hospitals of Florence and he studied for many, many years. He took um, the bodies of the dead or newly dead and really dissected them. Um, and so he tried to get the overall ability of the human figure. He really wanted to get in and know the human figure. And so this is what he did in Florence for, for many years in secret and then sometimes the, uh, some of his close friends did know. But he was the first to actually depict um, the embryo in the womb. She had just recently died and he had uh, autopsied her. And you have that very first time in, in art or in life that you have the ability to have someone who actually gave a realistic uh, depiction of uh, an embryo still in the womb. And this is Leonardo on the right. Um, he lived in relative terms a long time and so he did a lot of self-portraiture, uh, which kind of gives him the, the ideal of the, the genius. One of the things that happened, he didn't actually, he wasn't very popular during his lifetime. People knew of him, um, but they didn't really uh, know a lot about his work, which makes it kind of a, a, the mystery of that around him. Uh, but one of the things that he did, he did three massive volumes of sketches, which uh, became popular and, and, and people realized that he was really a genius after his death, which, uh, which is good for us, but um, part of his notebooks, which um, as you can see, we were talking about this earlier, which was makes it interesting. Um, many of you have probably seen this image of him, right? Yes, no, yes, uh, the Trivia Man, and, so, and also the flying machine. But a lot of people probably don't really know is that he, he sketched the human form. He did the brain. He did uh, arms and legs and form because he really wanted to know what the body looked like, either inside and out. And so part of his art, a lot of his art, um, goes into a lot of the diagramming of that. So he in itself um, studied medicine, studied anatomy, studied um, geology, everything that you can probably imagine in the sciences, which was the theme of the, of the, of the Renaissance. And the, it was a rediscovery, it was a rebirth of, of the classics and of the, the sciences, if you will. And so he in himself is considered um, the total Renaissance man. I'm sure you all have heard that term, the, the Renaissance man, but he was he was literally supposed to, uh, he was the one that kind of named that after. Um, in fact, the University of South Alabama just recently has gotten, and I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, the, uh, it's a, a laparoscopy robot called the Da Vinci S, and I don't know, it's, it's, it's very, it was a big deal at South Alabama Medical School that they were able to afford this, but those are the things that he's named after because he was so, um, so good into the medicines, into the sciences, and depicting them because of his skill. 
Another one of the famous artists that I wanted to bring up was Michelangelo. Um, when you think of the art of this time, you think of the 14, 1500s, these were the guys that you think of. These were the high artists. These were the ones getting paid by the Pope. These are the ones creating their tombs. Uh, Michelangelo, as you can see, this is the Pope of uh, Duke of Bernardino, and he was another one of the great artists that actually went into the hospitals and autopsied some of the bodies. So he was um, another one that really wanted to study the human form and know the human form. In doing that, um, he, the epitome of the Renaissance art in the world is, is the David. And if y'all have ever seen the David, he's about 15 feet tall. He's made of a, a solid block of marble. The Pope came to him and said, make something of this. And, and Michelangelo said, what? I, he had quite the temper. And so uh, he created one of the greatest masterpieces of the Renaissance of this time. So if you were a wealthy patron during this time, you know of these guys. You know of Leonardo. You know of Michelangelo because you hear it. Um, the literacy that was around the popes were the ones that were literate. The, the clergy were the ones that who could read and write. Um, the Middle Ages and the turn of the Renaissance, they, the, the everyday people, the everyday populace could not read or write. Um, the percentage of that is, is very, very high that they could not. But what they did see were the visions, were the paintings, were the, the works, the frescoes that were on the, the, the walls of the, of the chapels and of the churches. And so that, therefore, the any kind of devotional item the church wanted to represent made it very powerful because that's all they saw. And so, um, and we'll get into that a little bit. I wanted to bring in the uh, the Last Judgment because it's one of his masterpieces as well. It's in the it's in the back part of the Sistine Chapel and it has newly been uh, cleaned. But it it shows you the the dramatic impression of that scene in Matthew and it was uh, the human form. Each, every Every little figure has a perfect form. Um, and so you can see how the study of the, the human form and of their potential to even question God um, is one of the things that, that makes the art uh, of this time and, the, and what was going on at this time very um, popular. The third and final that I'm going to go into is Raphael. Not many people know who Raphael is. He's a, he, only, he died at 37, so he was a very kind of a quick genius, got in, got out. Um, but he also talked about humanism and, and, and Renaissance, the rebirth of the classics, the Plato, the Aristotle. One of his most famous here is the School of Athens, which is in the papal uh, apartments in the Vatican. Uh, the, each of these figures represents a classical figure. And so um, you have Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and everybody lined around from everyone you've ever heard of. So it was kind of, uh, if you will, hip. It was in the trend. It was, um, it was all about the classics and the, the, the knowledge that they brought. And this is a great little picture of Raphael um, during that time. But the high art in and of itself was considered the Aristotle, the classical world. Um, Things that happened during the Renaissance that really kind of changed the face of the culture and the society, as well as the religious aspect. Um, Protestant Re Reformation. Two things happened prior to the Protestant Reformation. Gutenberg invented his Bible. 1462, he was able to, um, excuse me, did I say Gutenberg? Excuse me, Gutenberg printed the Bible. Um, Gutenberg invented the printing press. And with that came two major things. They were able to uh, distribute books throughout Europe. They were able to um, take the written word and make it to the populace. And people were able to read and write. It became a culture. It became a fad, if you will. Um, with that being said, we did have the Bible that came through with Martin Luther. He was able to do his, his Bible and able to go through and really kind of get those words, that they, the visions that they see on paper. And so the, the populace was able to come up and read, and um, they were, the trend was to read and to write. And so with the Protestant Reformation, <coughs> with Martin Luther, came the idea that uh, the everyday person could have the one-on-one -on -one ability to have that interaction with God. They didn't need the Catholic Church. Um, 
about 1517 is when that personal faith and, and where the Martin Luther and all of these guys that kind of went against the church, if you will, became popular. Um, the church was being corrupt at this time. Uh, there was a, a relics were being uh, made to make money off of the church. The popes were corrupt. They were um, having children outside of the of their uh, which they were not, of course, allowed to have children. They had adulterous affairs. It was just a very corrupt society in the Vatican at this time. And so with the Protestant Reformation came that ideology that they could, uh, you can have a one-on-one -on -one, um, practice with God and with the faith, and you didn't have to go through that intermediate. Um, so what the church did at this time is that they counteracted that. They did the counter-reformation. And so they actually... <laughs> basically did a, a, a multiple doctrines onto the, the religion of, of, of Catholicism. They wanted to, to go back to the basics of Catholic uh, ideologies and go into a lot of the educational aspects. And so one of the things that happened is Ignatius of Loyola was a Spanish nobleman. And he came in and um, said to the church, look, we could start this, basically do a marketing term, mm -hmm. if you will, um, and started the Jesuits. And that, the Jesuit order really was part of the education. They were about missionary, they were about schooling, and they were about the doctrine of the Catholic Church. And so they were very much uh, effective in Latin America. And we'll talk about the transition of the ex votos, and as it goes from Italy to Latin America, that's how, that was the way they were able to, to teach the Catholic doctrine. Um, and so with the Counter-Reformation, a new surgence in education came about, but also the ability to go to the new world. And so that was uh, very effective. And then Gutenberg's printing press uh, was in 1456. And that's where um, another thing that happened is they were able to do Dante's Divine Comedy. And they actually printed it over and over in Milan and Venice and Florence. And they ever, everybody was thinking about the Catholic Church, about heaven and hell and purgatory, because those were the things that were going on at this time. So in Italy, you have, um, it was very interesting because not, one of the things that you don't have in the history books are ex votos. They are not in the, the art history books. So it was, it was more of a searching and wondering what, who, who created these and what were they for. Um, starting in Italy, because you, you need to start in Italy, because with, you, with all of the society and the city states that were able to do the commercial uh, trading, the money was there. So they had the ability with the printing press, with the money, to kind of start, and that's why you have the Renaissance starting in Italy and growing from there. Um, so starting in Italy in the 1500, uh, 1501, this is the earliest expo I could find. And as you can see, it's very similar to, if you're familiar with any of the Italian um, or Northern Renaissance early 1400 paintings or 1500 paintings, it's very similar to that. Um, but again, you have, you actually don't have a, a deity here. You don't have a saint. Uh, but you do have the prayer and you do have the sickness. And so it's, it's interesting how you'll see um, artists who have, this is the only known artist that we know on, on the history books that actually has created an exposure of this time period. And so the rest of them were done with, um, by everyday painters. Very similar to folk art now. It was the personal expression of that artist at that time. Um, and they didn't particularly have um, a reputation, if you will. And this is another one. Uh, <laughs> this is very interesting because um, <coughs> a lot of them have to do with a narrative of what happened in the event or the miracle. And this happened to be just a representation of her being saved. And so these items would go into homes that were very modest. Um, none of these really came into the home of the Medici's, if you will, the, the, large, the large families in Florence at the time. <laughs> none of these really made it to the, the dukes and the duchesses. They were made for um, the lower to, to middle class folks who really wanted to celebrate, really wanted to represent their piety to, to their God and, and to thank them, or to say, and we'll see this, thank them for saving them during um, during their time. And here's a couple more that, um, that you'll see that I, he obviously has smallpox, is what they say, but you can tell the, the difference between the Leonardo's, the Raphael's, and the, 
and the Michelangelo's versus the everyday painter. Um, you don't have the structure there, you don't have the perspectives there, you don't have the anatomy quite there. But yet it does represent the medicine of the time, what was happening during that time, who, who was there and what the needs of them were. Um, you have the saints in the corner, you have the, the, the person praying, the sister or the brother, um, and then you have the sick lying in the bed. So when you have the populace who may, um, who knew of people getting sick at that time, this is a representation that says, you know, this is actually what it looks like, and this is what I'm praying for, because it'll work. Okay, so the, as the literacy came, um, the books came, but the, the exvoters did not go away. The representation of um, something that could help save my family, uh, we're still with it. <coughs> And again, you'll see, these are all made, um, in the beginning, they were made of canvas. Um, with the Gutenberg Bible, um, initially artwork was made on vellum or parchment paper from sheepskin. But as the Gutenberg Bible was able to, uh, the Gutenberg printing press was able to come through and, and create books, that pulpus fiber was able to make things less expensive. So they're able to paint on that. And as the time grew of these ex photos, they grew came on, on tin because tin became very less expensive. They're small objects. They were able to be posted into the church um, or into the house. Things kind of changed either in the house or at the church because they all they all are different. That when you're talking about the Italian situation, they're all generally in the homes of the of the, uh, of the Italians. Um, they're generally small. They're generally in the home, um, and if you See, we never had um, that many symbols in them, but you still have the simple aspect of the, the, the surgeon doctor coming in, treating the wound, um, treating the event that's happening, and then you have the pious person trying to, to work the miracle. But it does give you a good representation of, of, of what happens uh, during that time for a surgery. This is what happened uh, in a home not to in a hospital, but in a home, because those were the humble beginnings and the humble aspects of that. During this time, there were medical guides that the church used, and we do have some representation of that uh, in the exhibition. And these are, I just brought you some, some uh, examples of, of what they have uh, that were brought to Mexico at the time. And these were kind of the, the oldest written form of, of the the medical guides that that uh, the church was able to have and brought to uh, Latin America at that time. So, what are the things that that happened as the um, as the Jesuits and as the missionaries got to the New World? They brought the, the medical guides with them. They brought with them the ex votos. Um, they were able to um, go into the lands, see the people, and really kind of show them what was going on. They were the surgeons, if you will, at the time, because they had the, um, they had the guides. There, there was no one else. There were the missionaries, so they had to have basic medical practice. And so, um, but they also brought the ex photos with them. Um, they were small. They were able to also uh, instill the religious aspect of that and the, and the piety of that. And so the, these themselves, you kind of see how small they they really are, and how um, you always have the same, you always have that, and then you have the, the script as to, to what's going on. And there's a couple other, these were on 10, as you can see they have holes in them, they were kind of brought, we're circa 1900 now, and as they get into um, the, the Mexican tradition, brought to Brought to Mexico in the 1500s, um, you know, these exposures were really um, supposed to be in, in hopefully saving this particular one. Um, and you can see that at the bottom of them, they have a lot of verbiage, kind of telling you the whole story, telling you what's going on. And hopefully he will be saved or um, <coughs> rescued from his injuries. Um, as it gets into Mexico and it gets into the everyday man's uh, kind of repertoire, if you will, um, it kind of get, crosses over into the realm of folk art because if you talk about high art or, or art history or in the art history books or, or how they got there, 
Um, a lot of times uh, you have certain artists that were written about, but these guys weren't really written about. Um, these are the works that kind of came through um, and they were supposed to teach you, they were supposed to tell you what was going on and to hopefully save that person because they were praying and having that miracle for them. Um, these are the ones that I found at the turn of the century of the 1900s. And um, as you can tell, the, the depictions are, are different. They get a little bit more detail. Uh, and the doctors come in, and now they're at the, the hospital. Um, now that you can see that, you know, they're very graphic. Very often, these experiments are very graphic and very dramatic and want to, to, to tell you what was going on and, and why. Um, but as you go into the 1900s and you go into the, um, the 50s and the 60s, the message is still the same. They're still small, but then they become uh, a little bit more detailed, a little bit less highly, um, very much a, a kind of a depiction of what is going on. This is like 1954, 1959. Um, again, you still have the dramatics. Now you have three saints. So you have, um, in a sense, a uh, going from a form of telling a story to where you have just a, kind of an everyday event that's going on that they want to tell you about. And so the, the folk art aspect of telling their story, telling what their, um, what, how their life went is another thing that, that goes on when you talk about. Um, and I do love the way the, the, the doctors have, have changed through, through the years. Into the 2000s, these things are still going on, um, very much so throughout, uh, throughout Latin America. Um, they are being brought to the churches, they are being brought to the homes, and so what makes it very funny is that these um, that I found uh, and that are in on the website, they actually talk about this guy is actually celebrating his piano and his skill of having uh, the skills of the piano. So we've gone from saving tuberculosis and smallpox to celebrating piano skills, and so you still have the devotion, you still have um, he, him somewhat representing that, um, but it's the same premise, but yet in a different light. And so it's uh, now she, uh, this young lady, is very happy she has a car, very happy that the wind is in her hair. And so you go from a devotional um, relic to an everyday event, an everyday happening, and that's really kind of where it turns into um, the more folky aspect of that. And this is the Dia de los Muertos, where um, she's actually happy. Uh, her husband died many years ago, and um, she prayed to the saints to let her see him again. So every year, um, she sees him on the Day of the Dead. And so, she, and so this is a depiction that she put in her house about seeing her husband during uh, that vision during the Day of the Dead. So you can see how the whole transition of ex votos have, have transformed. And then you have... Again, you have the transition of the doctors and the hospitals, which is um, very interesting. One of the most famous artists that I have um, that I came across was uh, who have ever done an expo to actually have done one of these is Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo was married to Diego Rivera, the famous Mexican muralist for many years. Um, Frida was, um, as you can see from her expo here. Uh, she was struck by a bus when she was 18 years old. And so she went through a tra very traumatic life, and a lot of uh, events of her life had to do with illness and sick and medicine. And so uh, this is her right here. And, um, and so one of the styles that she painted in was the ex voto style. Um, she lived in Mexico City with her husband for many years, and um, in her house when she passed, for a tremendous amount of ex voto she had taken from churches in Mexico City. So she had gone into the, to the, uh, yeah, I know, um, had gone into the churches and taken it because that's, that's what she was interested in, that's what she, she enjoyed. Um, this is a, in fact, in the history book, this is what is called a Frida style ex voto, which is funny because in the 20th century, you know, she's considered a, a very leading female artist uh, of the, of the, 20th century, and so um, I wanted to, to show you all kind of a, a different aspect of her. Um, a suicide here, depicting a story. Um, uh, this is a memory of her going into the Henry Ford Hospital after one of her back surgeries. 
And so, um, and this is actually her memory of her getting uh, having childbirth and herself uh, being depicted there. Um, one of the things that's still going on to this day is this pilgrimage, if you will, of some of the larger churches in Mexico. And so I wanted to bring this in to show you that this is behind the altar. This is where they wanted to, this is where they placed it in this particular church. This is the second largest pilgrimage site in Mexico. Um, and so these ex photos are not only, you can kind of have an idea of how small they are with the, with the guys here. Um, some of them are larger, some of them, but they're all personal. And they're all uh, all about devotion to the Catholic Church and to the, to the God and to, and to the saint of which they, they have their certain miracle for. Um, and this is one of the, the beautiful churches that they have there. And there's the two other um, depictions of, and you can see all the variety of different styles and different sizes that, that are around. Um, they also are called the tablos. Uh, which is a smaller church. Santos are retablos in, in Mexico, and so um, basically meaning they're smaller and they're and they're more portable and more personal. That is it. Anybody has any questions? Comments?